I am referring to none other than our friend, Mr. Ujjal Dosanjh. I first got to know of Ujjal Dosanjh in February 1985. I was a student at the time, and I was watching TV. And in TV, he was in a hospital bed because he was physically attacked for raising voices. One of the images that still stands out for me is, 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 it, is that in spite of him being in a hospital, he was not showing any signs of fear. He was showing bravery. He was still st speaking about what he stood for and what he believed in. And what I saw in 85 is what I have seen since then. Whatever the occasion may have been, our friend Ujjal has been there. He has raised voices. He's spoken out against fundamentalism. And as Dr. Ambedkar said, the caravan of social justice must carry on, must move, continue to move forward. So has our friend Ujjal Dosanjh. For over 25 years, Ujjal Dosanjh has been carrying that caravan of social justice and free societies and secularism forward. Friends, please join me in welcoming our friend Ujjal Dosanjh. Thank you very much. Um, much has been said by uh, people that are more eloquent than I. Charlie, Adrian, uh, Jenny, Carrie, Dave, others. Um, and uh, particularly Major Sidhu. Um, this is not um, an easy issue to speak on. Um, we all remember, at least I remember, the morning of the um, Air India um, uh, disaster. Um, I was at home and, uh, and we listened to the radio and television and uh, realized that uh, Canada had become home at least until then, to the largest aviation terrorism incident in the history of human beings. Um, and, and it is not as if we didn't know that these kinds of things may happen. Many of us um, had been raising those voices long before um, June of 1985. And I say this because I know how difficult it is, one, to speak about these issues, and I, that's why I have the highest uh, regard and affection for, um, for Gurpreet, because I believe Gurpreet is uh, that kind of fearless soul uh, who believes in something and pursues it uh, to its most logical conclusion, regardless of whatever the consequences may be. And that's why when he asked me, when he told me that he was going to, uh, this was going to happen, the books were going to be released, um, I readily agreed that I would like, love to be part of it because this is one way of paying tribute to those that have perished and to the courage and resilience and the dedication and commitment of the, the families of the victims who've actually pursued seeking solutions to these issues. They've turned their personal tragedies into a crusade in their own different ways for achieving the peace and harmony that we as human beings are entitled and have every right to believe that we have that right to exist in. And, you know, in those days, uh, we, we did write letters to the prime ministers, to the attorneys general, to the ministers of justice. And I, I remember writing one such letter back in April of 1985, uh, which was sent to both the Prime Ministers and the Premiers and the Attorneys General, uh, at least in British Columbia, and to the Attorney General and others. I'm telling you that story because I want to refer to what Charlie was talking about, that some of us or some communities were seen and may still be seen as the other, 
uh, at that time. And the shadow, the Canadian shadow that uh, Charlie talked about. And I remember feeling this in my heart at that time, and actually I remember saying it on television, that the political leadership of the country at that time felt that these guys, some brown guys, some with turbans, some with not turbans, were fighting each other and they weren't Canadian and it didn't matter to Canada as long as nobody else got hurt. No matter what happened to this small community, um, it didn't matter. I had that feeling. I said so publicly at that time. And I believe things have changed for the better. But I am saddened that it has taken the likes of the Air India disaster and 27 years to make those changes that are still incomplete. And I don't believe one political party or one uh, government of a particular stripe was responsible for this. I think this goes beyond politics. It goes beyond partisanship. It is about how the politicians of all political parties, and perhaps with some exceptions, view ethnic minorities, visible minorities in this country. That may be so in other countries as well. I'm, we're only talking about Canada. And I, you know, have been fond of saying all my life, and it's still true, if something happened in the west end of Vancouver, no government officials, cops, or anyone else would run to the nearest church and say, let's get, talk to the church leaders and find out what's happening in this community. When it happens in a particular visible minority, Let's go to this temple. Let's go to this mosque. Let's go to this Gurdwara. Let's figure out what's happening with these guys. And that is the double standard. And that double standard existed back in 1985. And that double standard exists today. That is the issue that goes to the heart of the question as to whether or not we, as Canadians, have the will and the determination to protect our secular space, the, our secular public space, where we can have a conversation and a dialogue as completely equal citizens, regardless of what our faiths or identities might be. And I think that that is the question, you know, obviously, that, um, that Gurpreet addressed with his second book. And with the first book, um, which is uh, Fighting Hatred with Love. It is absolutely wonderful. This the title conveys the whole story. You can't fight terrorism with terrorism. You can't fight violence with violence. It is impossible to do that. You can't take an eye for an eye. What you need is not just, in fact, and I'm no longer a politician, so I'm not really addicted to it anymore. But, <laughs> but let's not just talk about politicians. I think we, those who are not elected, those who are not elected, those who vote and cast ballots, are also responsible. Because we do not make the kinds of demands that we can make of those that we elect. We don't expect, we don't tell them that we expect them to continue to enhance the secular space for us in this country. Not to ban religions, not to ban worship. For all I care, somebody could hang themselves up and down and worship. I have no problems with that, as long as it doesn't interfere with my life. Um, ultimately, you have, in fact, the journalists being threatened, those journalists that actually have tried to create and protect and strengthen that secular space. I'm sure Gurpreet is no stranger to those threats. Um, there is uh, a recent incident of a, a very senior journalist in India having written about a particular period in recent Indian history and is now being asked to apologize. Uh, for writing about certain persons, not even religious prophets, but just persons. 
So I, I think that ultimately it is the obligation of the journalists to continue to enhance and protect that secular space. It is also your obligation and my obligation as ordinary citizens to make sure that they get the support and the politicians get the kind of emphasis that is important um, uh, to, to protect that secular space. Let me just end by saying these are the kinds of occasions where we can actually come together and talk about some of the fundamental values that bring us together as Canadians. And those values are very, very important. The values about compassion, fairness, justice, inclusion, and having peace and harmony in our society. But having lived in India and having been born and raised in India, having come from that country, from my experience, I can tell you that Canada now has more minorities in Canada than India has. India is a, a, a multicultural community, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-faith, you name it. There's been migration from all over the world to that country over time. However, Canada now is more multicultural, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-faith than India is. So if you have minorities coming out of your ears, countless minorities, you have to have some fundamental values and principles if you want to live in a peaceful society, if you want to continue to prosper, prosper as a peaceful society. And one of those fundamental principles is we understand, we know in the name of religion, millions more have been killed than perhaps in other wars. So if you, if you, we as politicians and you as politicians and you as human beings who aren't politicians continue to look at us and say, okay, what's his name? He's a Singh. What's his name? He's a Khan. What's his name? He is, that's a Christian name. If we continue to pigeonhole people and assess those personalities based on those issues, that is a recipe for disaster. That is why I say that faith leaders, faith leaders of all faiths, have an important role to play in any world, in any country. I, I see that uh, particularly the uh, Roman Catholic bishops from time to time issue appeals to governments on various issues about equality, about poverty, about fundamental issues that concern us all. I think, I think faith leaders have not only, a, not only a right to do that, but in fact they have an obligation to do that. Um, and, and I think that those are the kinds of issues that obviously they can be involved in. But I don't believe that faith leaders, no matter what their faith is, have a right to dictate to Canadian society how politics should be run in this country and what the basic values of that politics should be, how we need to dress, how we need to walk, and how, how we need to talk. That is the prerogative of the secular space. And uh, that's why I'm here standing alongside Gurpreet, commending him for actually enhancing and creating and establishing that secular space in a more prominent fashion, both in the South Asian community and sending a message out to the larger community saying, this is important. Don't think it's, this is not important to us as South Asians. This is important to us. So thank you very much for being here. And Gurpreet, thank you very much for doing the work you do. Saiban, Art Vasati Gadir Hai. Position, load, fire.